Praise the Lord. Psalms chapter 86. Psalm 86, verse number 5. When you have it, so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's enough to get it started then. The Bible reads in Psalm 86 and 5. O oh Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. Listen closely to my prayer, O oh Lord. Hear my urgent cry. I will call to you whenever I'm in trouble, and you will answer. No pagan God is like you, O oh Lord. None can do what you do. All the nations, you will make come and bow before you, Lord. They will praise your holy name, for you are great and perform wonderful deeds, and you are God alone. You alone are God. I want to preach on the subject this morning, no other God like him. No other God like him. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, you serve an awesome God. There's no other God like him. Psalms 86 is a psalm of David. In fact, it's really a prayer of David. Uh, David was a man of prayer. And you can see it all throughout the Psalms, David praying. And Psalms 86 is no different. David is making a petition to God. He is making a request to God for help because David's petition is God to show his strength and power in light of his opposition. So he is praying to God that God will show himself in the light of his oppositions because Psalm 86 is a prayer for protection. Watch this now. In the first four verses, David pleads his relationship with God. And then he moves to dealing with God's character. So he moves from his first three, the first four verses and he pleads his relationship with God, and then he moves to deal with God's character. In other words, he talks about God's forgiveness. He talks about God's mercy. He talks about God's compassion, and then he makes this awesome distinction of who God is. He makes an awesome distinction of who this God we serve is. And David says, and 86, 86 and 8, no pagan God is like you, O Lord, oh Lord, none can do what you do. One translation said, the King James Version said, among the gods there is none like unto you, O oh Lord, neither are there any works like unto your works. Amen. Now watch this now because this is a powerful observation on David's part because when it comes to God, you have to understand his preeminence. Let me say this again. When it comes to God, you have to understand his preeminence. In other words, there is a dominance about him that makes him different. Let me say this again. There is a dominance about God that makes him different. And this is the verse. This is, this is where a lot of people fail to see. Watch this now. They fail to see that there's nothing within the limits of possibility which he cannot perform. Let me say this again. They, they fail to see that there's nothing within the limits of possibility which he cannot perform. David said, there is no pagan God like you, O oh Lord. None can do what you do. There is none like unto you among the gods, O oh Lord. Neither are there works like unto yours. And he said, there's something about this God that we serve. You have to understand that David's day, uh, most people believed and polytheism. Right. Watch this now. In David's day, most people in his day 
believed in polytheism. They believed in the worship of more than one God. Watch this now. And all the nations of the earth were practicing polytheism. Watch this now. Even Israel were guilty of practicing polytheism. Watch this now. Polytheism, watch this now. That Stephen even talked about this. When he was being stoned to death in Acts chapter number 7, he talked about it in verses 40 through 43. He talked about how even though God had led them through the wilderness, Israel still had a heart for other gods. Let me tell you something. Let me, I wanna, let me just put it in a day's uh, uh, terms. Even though people are coming to church, just because you come to church, you can come to church and still have hearts for other gods. Yeah. So I want to share something with you that when they were in the wilderness, not all of them was worshiping the true and living God. Although they had a church in the wilderness, everybody wasn't in church in God. Watch this now. Some of them never truly worshiped God, and most of them were paid polytheistic people. Watch this. Jesus said, watch this. Jesus said this in, in Luke Gospel 12 and, and 2. He said, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed nor, hid, nor hidden that will not be known. This is what Jesus said. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4 and 5, he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Watch this. In Acts chapter number 17, it's 7, not 17, in Acts chapter 7, God revealed who they were really worshiping in the wilderness. Watch this now. I want you to go to Acts chapter 7, verse number 41. Because in Acts chapter 7, verse number 41, Stephen is being stoned, but he says something that's so profound before he dies, and he, he, he tells them who they really was worshiping in the wilderness. The Bible said in Acts 7, Verse number 41, this is what he says in Acts 7 and 41. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idols, and rejoiced in the works of their own hand. Verse number 42 said, then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heavens as it was written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifice during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Watch this now. One translation said no, but this is what it says. You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the stars of your God reft from hand, images which you made to worship. In other words, he said, everybody in the wilderness wasn't worshiping me, but there are some people in the wilderness was, was worshiping Molech. They were worshiping other gods. And watch this now. Just about all throughout Israel history, they had a heart for pagan gods or false gods. Let me say this again. Just about, through, just about through all of their history, they had a heart for pagan gods or false gods. In other words, just about all throughout Israel history, they were polyistic people. Polytheistic people. Watch this. And watch this now. Now, I, wanted to, I want you to understand something, that how did these people who were called by God's name, pick up a habit of worshiping other gods besides God. Watch it now. How, how is it that you were walking with God? You were seeing miracles perform, but you picked up this bad habit of worshiping other gods. I'm going to tell you how. They picked it up by associating themselves with wrong, the wrong people. Let me tell you something. You have to watch who you associate with this walk with God because if you get connected with the wrong people, it can jeopardize your relationship with God. Watch this. The heart for other gods came from wanting to be like the non-believer who were all around them. Let me tell you something. And this is what's going on now. The hearts to, to serve other things and do things that are inappropriate to God come from the people that you're hanging with. Watch this now. When your heart is in the wrong place and when you are hanging with the wrong people, you will refuse to hear anything that comes from God. Let me say this again. When your heart is in the wrong place, ooh, that's a bad combination. And you are hanging with the wrong people, it will cause you to refuse to hear anything that comes from God. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 
36, 2 Chronicles chapter number 36, verse number 11. Because I want to talk about Zedekiah for a moment. Zedekiah was a king in Jeremiah's day that God tried to speak to because he was going down the wrong way and God raised up Jeremiah to go and be a prophetic voice in dark times to Zedekiah. But I want you to see something in this, this, this 2 Chronicles 36 and 11. This is what he said. The Bible said, I'm going to be reading out of a different translation, but just stay with me. It says Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. The Bible said that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and he refused to humble himself when the prophet Jeremiah spoke to him directly from the Lord. Watch this now. He said, so he refused to humble himself, although Jeremiah came to represent the Lord, was speaking on the behalf of the Lord. He refused, and the Bible said in verse number 13, he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, even though he had taken an oath, a lo a oath of loyalty in God's name. So he didn't took an oath in God's name, and he still don't want to do right. And Zedekiah was a hard and stubborn man, refusing to turn to the Lord, the God of Israel, and likewise all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful because they followed all the pagan practices of the surrounding nations, desecrating the temple of the Lord that had been consecrated in Jerusalem. Watch this now. Verse number 15 said, So the Lord, the God of Israel, the, their ancestors repeatedly sent his prophets to warn them. For he had compassion on his people and his temple, but the people marked these messengers of God and despised their words. They sacrificed at the prophets, and they sacrificed the prophets until the Lord's anger could no longer be restrained and nothing could be done. So guess this now. They sacrificed God's messengers. Everyone that God sent to them, they killed them. Watch it now. Because they came speaking the, the, unrated, the unadulterated word of God to them, and it made them mad. But the Bible said in verse number 17, so the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them, the Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men, young women, the old and the infirm. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. Listen, listen. Every time that the nation of Israel operated in a polytheistic way, they found, they were found unfaithful in the sight of God. Watch this now. Every time they worship these many gods, they found themselves to be unfaithful to God because polytheism and the true and living God cannot work. Watch this now. It's like oil and water. You can't mix the two together. You cannot mix polytheism and the true and living God together. It will not work. It will not work because, first of all, we have to realize that God won't stand for it. Watch this now. Because God's first commandment was in Exodus 20 and 3, you shall have no other gods before me. That's his first command. His first commandment after he delivered them from Egypt was you shall not have no other gods before me. One translation said you must worship me. Now, you, you must not worship any other gods except me. And another translation said, in verse number five, he said, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Watch this now, because I want you to understand something. Then he goes on to reiterate it in Exodus 34 and 14, for you shall not worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealousy is a jealous God. I need you to understand something because I'm going somewhere here. He said in Exodus 30, 34 and 14, and you shall, uh, you shall worship no other gods for the Lord whose name is jealousy is a jealous God. Watch this now. In other words, he said my name is jealousy. My name is jealousy. In other words, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew name that God is talking about is the Elkanah. Watch this now. I want you to understand what the Elkanah is. The Elkanah, it means consuming fire. It means jealousy 
a jealous God. That's what Elkanah means. It means consuming fire. It means jealous God. In other words, the Elkanah is a divine emotion that God has for his people. Watch this now. The Elkanah is not only just his name, but it is a divine emotion that God has for his people. It's a godly jealousy or a holy jealousy that causes God to want to protect, provide, and bless his people. Watch this now. I want to say this again. You, that God, there is a godly jealous about, there's something about God that makes him jealous and it causes him to want to protect you to provide for you and to bless you because you are his. Let me tell you, boy, that's a blessing within itself. When you, oh my God, I love the Elkanah. I love the, 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 the God, the Elkanah. I love this jealous God because he have a passion for those who are called by his name. Watch this. David understood this. Listen, because the only way to really get to know God is from a monotheistic approach. Let me say this again. The only way to really get to know God is from a monotheistic approach. Watch this. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will have loyal, he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. That's what he said. One translation says this. You can't worship two gods at once. That's what he said. He said you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one, one God, you will end up hating the other. Adoration for one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money. Watch this. This is why polytheism this is why God hates polytheism. The reason why God hates polytheism is because polytheism divides the heart. Let me say this again. It, it divides the heart. And God doesn't work apart from your heart. In other words, God don't want your heart to be broken up into parts. Let me say this again. He don't want your heart to be broken up into parts. He wants all of your heart, not pieces of your heart. He wants the whole thing. He wants it all. He wants the whole kitten and caboodle. He wants all of your heart, but he don't want your heart to be divided up into portions. Why? We are living in a time where most people are polyo, polytheistic and don't even know it. Watch this now. They don't even know that they're polytheistic. Watch this. In other words, they are worshiping more than one God and don't even know it. And that's why God had me to preach this message. And that is why so many people, hearts are divided. And you truly, you won't never truly get to know God if your heart is divided. You can't truly understand God if your heart is divided. A lot of people have their hearts open to other gods. And it's destroying their relationship with the true and living God. Watch this now. America is a polytheistic nation. It's a polytheistic nation. Watch this. Everybody in America, just about, I can't say everybody, but just about everybody is going after the bag. Everybody is going after the money. Everybody wants money. In this country, money has become the greatest God in America. It's the greatest God in America because all people want is to go chase after the bag. They want money. So because they don't understand that they have made money their God. I, I'm not saying money is not good. I'm not, please don't misunderstand me. But money is good in this place. But when you are, are obsessed with making money, you can't sleep. You can't do, you can't come to that place of worship because you so bit on making money. Then that money has become your God. And then there's the God of sex. We're living in a country that is obsessed with promiscuity. There is, I mean, it's sex everywhere. It's fornication, 
homosexuality, adultery, and people are having sex with any and everybody. It's like people can't control themselves. Do you not know that the STDs are higher than ever before? Watch this now. It said that in the United States alone, they said more than 110 million people currently have an STD. With 20 million new infections occurring each year. And you mean to tell me they have made sex out of a God. Sex on TV. Sex on the social media. Sex even in the church. Yeah. This God of money, this God of sex and God, I know I'm going to step on some toes right now. But I hear, I'm come here as God's representative. And then there's the God of sports. This country is obsessed with sports. And I ain't got I ain't nothing wrong with watching a game or two, but these people have went overboard with these sports because some people have made sports out of a God. They, they can't break away from it. They can't even come to church because the game on. They can't even get rest. You got people, oh my God, oh my God, these sports, this, this country is infatuated with sports. Let me tell you this. They can tell you every stat of the NBA, NBA draft or the NFL draft, but they can't quote a scripture to, call, to say they life. But they can tell you who such and such is, his stats, how many touchdowns he made, what his running game, what's his rushing game. They can tell you all these things, but if you ask them to quote a scripture to say their life, they cannot do it. It's amazing that you will come to church and fall asleep but stay up all night and watch a game. It's the truth. Then there's the, the God of the, console, the gaming console. Where husband and wives are getting divorced because the main lover is the PlayStation 5 or the Xbox 360. It's, we got a problem. They said that the, the, game, the, the, the gaming console is destroying families. You got people that want to go to work or showing up work late because they too busy punching buttons all night playing some type of game and don't realize that that is an artificial thing. That is nothing. That is not going to help your life in no form or fashion. Jeremiah 2 and 11 says, has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Even though they are not gods at all, yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. And a lot of times people have traded in this glorious God's God for worthless idols. Anytime, watch this, anytime we give most of our time, if not all of our time to it, that thing has become a God. And none of them things, watch this now, these idols, these false gods, or these pagan gods can truly fulfill you. Watch this now. All they can do is turn your heart from the true and living God. That's all these things can do. The only thing these things can do is turn your heart from the true and living God. They can't help you in your time of need. Because true intimacy come from a monotheistic approach. Watch this. Jesus said, they asked Jesus a question. What is the greatest commandment of them all? And Jesus said, and in Matthew 22 and 37, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. It's give God all of you, not fragments and pieces and parts of you, but he wants all of your heart, ladies and gentlemen. See, the monotheistic approach is how you really get to know who God is. That's the only way you can really get to know who God is. David said in 86, Psalms 86 and 8, no Pagan God is like you, O oh Lord. None can do what you do. 
In other words, David understood that there is a dominance about him that makes him different. There's nothing within the limits of possibility which he cannot perform. David said in that 86th chapter, verse 10, for you are great and perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. Watch this. How did David come to this conclusion? He came to this conclusion because his heart was set upon the one and only true and living God. That's how he was able to make come to this conclusion. His heart was set, ladies and gentlemen, of the true and living God. His heart was not divided like everybody else that was around him. He didn't give his heart to other gods. He didn't give his heart to the God of Molech. He didn't give his heart to, to, to Astaroth. He didn't give his heart to Baal. He didn't give his heart to Dagon. He didn't give it, but he set his heart on Elkanah, the consuming fire, the jealous God, the real God, the God that protects, provides, and blesses his people. Yeah. And because David knew God in a monotheistic way, he invested all of himself in God. Watch this now. When you worship God in a monotheistic way and you get to know who he really is, it will cause you to invest all that you have into this God. That's why he came to the conclusion and said, there's no God like you because I have a monotheistic view of you. I see only you. I don't see Moloch. I don't see Astaroth. I don't see Baal. I don't see Dagon. What I see is Elkanah. I see the true and living God. He invested all of himself in God because Psalms 86 and 4 said, oh Lord, for I have, for, oh Lord, for I give myself to you. This is what he said. He said in Psalms 86 and 4, oh Lord, for I give myself to you. One translation said, oh Lord, for I worship only you. Yeah. Another translation said, I put myself in your hands, oh God. Because there's no other God like him. It's, some, it's so many things that make God different from all the rest. Watch this. There are so many things that makes him different, that makes him stand out from the rest. I don't understand how the body of Christ can't see this. I don't, I don't understand how the body of Christ don't, can't feel this. But there's something different about the God that we serve. There's nothing that can compare to him. There's nothing that can compare to his power. Why serve false and pagan gods? When the Bible said they, have, they are idols of silver and gold made by hands, they have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell, they have hands but cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound from their throats. But we serve a God that speaks to us, that sees us, that hears us, that touches us, that walks with us. We serve a God that is great and wonderful, that does great and wonderful things. We serve a God that performs. Our God performs. There is no other God like him. There is nothing that can compare to him. There's nothing that can compare to his power. A pagan God cannot match. It's not a matchup for the true and living God. You better ask the Philistines. You better ask the Philistines, the Philistines. And in 1 Samuel chapter 5, the Philistines tried to keep the ark of God in the house of Dagon. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter number 5. Verse number one. In First Samuel, chapter number five, the Philistines tried to keep the house, the ark of God in the house of Dagon because of Israel's sins. It was there because Israel insists on sinning before God. In other words, they were, see, because of their sin, they were able to capture the ark of the Lord and they placed it in the temple of Dagon. In other words, it was arrogance on their part because the Philistines thought that Dagon 
Their false god was better and greater than the true and living God, the God of Israel. Watch this now. I, I want you to understand because this was the mind of the Philistines. They thought that their God, Dagon, their false God, was greater than the true and living God, the God of Israel. When they, watch this now, because when they brought the ark of the Lord and they placed it in the temple of Dagon, this was supposed to be what they called the triumph of the gods. Let me say this again. They brought, the reason why they brought the ark of the covenant, the ark of the presence of God, to the temple of Dagon, because they thought that it was going to be the triumph of the gods. And in, in essence, the Philistines believed that Dagon, their pagan god, had prevailed over the true and living God, the God of Israel. Oh, my God. But they had wishful thinking. They had wishful thinking. They had this triumph of gods in their mindset, thinking that Dagon, their false god, was greater than the true and living God, the God of Israel. They thought that Dagon had prevailed over the God of Israel. Watch this now. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 1. It reads, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it by Dagon. Watch this now. Please understand, because I need you to understand me. When they brought the ark of the Lord and placed it in the temple of Dagon, they placed the ark, watch this now, at the feet of Dagon. In other words, they... They placed the ark of God at the feet of Dagon as to say that Dagon had triumphed over the God of Israel. So they placed it at Dagon's feet out of arrogance to say that Dagon is greater than our God. Watch this now. And the Bible said in verse number 3, And when they of Ashdod, when the people of the city of Ashdod, Arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took, watch this, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. They said when they got there early the next day that Dagon was flat on his face. Oh, my God. Was flat on his face. Listen, it didn't take long for God to showcase his dominance. It don't take long, it don't take God long to showcase his dominance. When they came, when they came back the very next day, Dagon was falling up on his face on the earth before the ark of the Lord. Because watch this now, God, I want you to understand the reason why God had to do this. God had to restore himself. He had to restore himself to his uh pedicle of being the true and living God. The Bible said, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Watch this now. Go on to verse number four. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face of the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to, for, to him. Watch it. He said, I'm going to break this thing up and y'all ain't going to be there standing back up no more because I'm going to deal with this pagan God. I, how can you compare a pagan God to my glory? How can you compare a pagan God to what I can do? This time, God cut off his head and hands of Dagon and all that were left was a stump. God had broken and shattered Dagon, and all that was left was the, 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 the threshold that Dagon used to rest upon. That's the only thing that was left. And the Bible said in verse number 6, but the hand of the Lord. See, not only did God deal with Dagon, but God dealt with those that trusted in Dagon. He said, I'm going to move with, I'm going to move, first of all, I'm going to deal with your God. And second of all, I'm going to deal with you. 
See, he said, I'm going to deal with you because you had the uh, gall and audacity to think that Dagon was better than me. Right. So I'm going to deal with these Philistines. And watch this now, because the Bible said in verse number 6, but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod. The Bible said, now he, <laughs> he just de dealt with a God and took his hands, but he said, now the hand of the Lord was heavy on them in Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds. In other words, he smote them with tumors. Even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the, of the God of Israel shall not abide with us. In other words, we got to get this ark out of here. It cannot abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon, Dagon our God. So God said, I'm not only going to raise my hand against your God. But I'm going to raise my hands against you. And David said, in, in, in Psalms 86 and 8, no pagan God is like you, O Lord. None can do what you do. Verse 10 said, for you are great and perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. There is nothing within the limits of possibility which he cannot perform. Watch this now. Show me in the word of God where any pagan God or false God worked a miracle. Show me where Moloch performed the miracle. You won't find it. Show me where Baal performed the miracle. You won't find it. Show me where Astaroth performed the miracle. You won't find it. Show me what Dagon performed a miracle. You won't find it. But our God performs. He performed miracles. He performed miracles. We serve a God that parted the Red Sea. We serve a God that uh, produced water from a rock. We serve a God that rained down manna from heaven. We serve a God that protects, provides, and blesses his people. There's no other God like him. There's no other God. You can search the heavens high and low. You will never find a God like El Elkanah. You will never find a God like the true and living God. He's worthy to be praised. No other God like him. Standing all over this building. 